this uh, talk won't be uh, too uh, demanding, but rather it will uh, attempt to accomplish th three things. One, if you're not praying the rosary daily to exhort you to do so, if you are praying the rosary daily, then to encourage you to continue. And then three, to also, as I was asked to do, to help understand how better we might pray the rosary. So those are the three basic object, um, objects for the talk. And the talk will be divided into two parts. The first part will be why we pray the rosary, and the second part will be how, how to pray the rosary. So why and how. The uh, obvious reason that we pray the rosary, of course, is because it comes from Our Lady. And if anything uh, else is said uh, in this talk, um, it's that one important point that needs to be emphasized. We pray the rosary because our mother asks us to do so. And everything else will kind of fill in the blanks to um, underscore that important point. <clears throat> We're going to take a little tour through history in order to encourage us to pray the rosary. Back in the early 13th century, three men providentially, somewhat accidentally, met on a street corner in Rome. It was Angelus, Francis, and Dominic. And each of the three men prophesied something about the other. And um, Angelus said to Francis, you are going to receive the stigmata. And Dominic said to Angelus, you and your order are going to receive the scapular. And one day, my order will receive the rosary. And through the scapular and the rosary, she, our mother, will save the world. So we have, right from the very beginning, a promise that the rosary, in conjunction with the scapular, will save the world. These men, of course, were Brother Angelus from the Carmelite order, St. Francis, the Franciscan, and St. Dominic, the Dominican. <clears throat> Next, we'll jump ahead to that uh, one of those important dates that we should all know what it refers to, 1571, October 7th. It was Europe against the Ottoman Empire. In other words, Christians against the Muslims. The Holy League, the Christians, were outnumbered. Pope St. Pius V ordered that the churches in Rome be open for prayer day and night, to pray the rosary, to petition the Blessed Virgin Mary, so that the Holy League forces would be victorious. Don John, the commander of the Catholic fleet, had his soldiers with two hands, each holding an object, one a sword and the other a rosary. And so the soldiers themselves were praying the rosary as they fought when they could. As it turns out, when the battle began, the Ottoman or Muslim forces were winning. And then, somewhat suddenly, somewhat unexpectedly, the wind changed. The wind. Do you know that the word for spirit is the same word for wind in Hebrew? So the wind changed 180 degrees, and that's what enabled the naval forces of the Catholic fleet to win in the battle at Lepanto in 1571. 200 out of 270 Muslim ships were destroyed. 30,000 Turks died that day, while there were only four 
to 5,000 Christian casualties. And when the news of the victory reached Pope St. Pius V in Rome, he declared that a new feast day be celebrated, Our Lady of Victory, and then it was Pope Gregory the 13th to change that feast day to Our Lady of the Rosary. That's where we get the feast day of Our Lady of the Rosary, that victory, that important victory through her intercession that was able to defeat in an outnumbered way the Muslim forces. Moving a little ahead now, jumping ahead, we'll go to 1917, July 13th. <clears throat> Obviously, Our Lady said a lot during that time at Fatima. And the one particular thing that I just want to highlight that she said was to pray the rosary every day in honor of Our Lady of the Rosary because only she can help you. Only she can help you. She is requesting that the rosary be prayed every day. Every day. She backed up her promise, her assurance, <clears throat> on October 13th when the sun moved in a miraculous way and 70,000 sun-gazing miraculous watchers were able to testify that Our Lady keeps her words. She promised a miracle and she delivered one, and there were over 70,000 people to witness it. Next we'll move 28 years later. <clears throat> the year was 1945, and the date was August 6th. Now, we should automatically hear in August 6th the Transfiguration, the Feast of the Transfiguration. We know that the Feast of the Transfiguration is when <clears throat> our Lord manifests his divinity through the allowing that brightness of the divinity to pass through his clothing. His clothes were whiter than snow, Scripture says. So that's the transfiguration. It's also on that particular day that the U.S., the United States, manifested her power through the bright light of dropping the atomic bomb on Japan. One mile <clears throat> from ground zero, where the bomb was dropped. So throughout, throughout many miles, the whole city was leveled, absolutely leveled. And within one mile of ground zero, where the bomb dropped, a church had been completely destroyed. But there was a house that was built right adjacent to the church. And that house stood standing. And not only did the house still stand after the bomb was dropped, but the eight Jesuit missionaries were still alive. In fact, practically unscathed with maybe a few cuts or bruises. One of the priest survivors that spoke for the eight Jesuit missionaries said that we believe, quote, that we survived because we were living the message of Fatima. He said, quote, we lived and prayed the rosary daily in that home. Daily. Praying the rosary daily. And she said, because only Our Lady of the Rosary can help you. That's what Our Lady said. Now we'll go to 1978. And I'm pretty uh, confident that most of us were around in that year. I know I was a living and I was in college, but I didn't know what happened that was terribly significant on January 15th. January, most people might think Super Bowl and you're absolutely right. It was the Sunday in which the Dallas Cowboys clobbered the Denver Broncos. But not only was that not terribly important for me. Um, we also probably didn't hear, even if I was watching the news, why that particular date is very important to us. 
You see, most people would have been watching the Super Bowl and they might not have heard the news that a serial killer had escaped from prison. And he just happened to be heading toward this one particular sorority, Chai Omega. And they probably didn't hear the news either. And they, like most Americans on that Sunday night, were completely oblivious as to the danger that could be knocking on their door. Turns out, Ted, Bu Ted Bundy knew exactly where he was going. And when he entered the sorority at about 3 a.m. in the morning, two young women were immediately murdered. Then he found three others and seriously injured them. There was one girl left that he was looking for, and as he searched the house, he finally found her and found her asleep in her bedroom. He entered the bedroom, and as he was standing right over her, she woke up, and she saw a man with a bat about to come down upon her. When Ted Bundy eventually was on death row, so he's going to be done in at this point, his spiritual counselor, Monsignor Kur, said as he was asking Ted Bundy what had happened on that particular night, Ted Bundy said, I fully intended to kill that girl when I entered that room that night. But, he said, there was some mysterious power that prevented him. You see, before this young woman who was laying in bed that night went away to college, her grandmother made her promise that she would pray the rosary every night before she went to bed for protection. That young woman kept the promise that she made to her grandmother. And so when Ted Bundy approached her bed and was about to murder her as well, what he saw in her hand was a rosary. And he said, some mysterious power prevented me. So let's take a quick review. We were told in the 13th century that Our Lady's power would save the world. We saw in the 16th century that the wind changed 180 degrees in order to allow the Catholic forces to defeat the Muslim ships. We were told in 1917 that only Our Lady can save us. And we saw in 1945 that her power was more powerful than an atomic bomb. And finally, we saw in 1978 that her power could stop a serial killer dead in his tracks. Anyone who wants to can have access to this power. It is not mysterious to us. We know exactly where this power comes from, Our Lady of the Rosary. And she's been around for 2,000 years. Our Lady told St. Matilde in the 13th century that next to God, that she had the greatest power in heaven and on earth. So we have to apologize to Ted Bundy. Sorry, it's not mysterious. It is powerful, yes, but we know where it comes from. The late great exorcist, Father Gabriel Amorth, reported how during an exorcism where the demons often speak, one demon cried out, if Christians knew how powerful the rosary was, it would be my end. So even though we might know about the rosary, even though we might have heard about Our Lady, we might not be tapping into that power as much as we actually can. Certainly that's what this demon thought. People living in Arizona are proud of many things. They have the Grand Canyon. They have warm weather all year round. 
They also have some of the most liberal gun laws in the country. People in Arizona are often called zoners, and they don't leave home without packing. <laughs> they carry their weapons often wherever they go. In fact, there was one store that I walk by frequently, and it says, no weapons allowed inside. You know, you have to have that kind of a sign if you don't want any weapons, you know, inside. But I suggest that we all imitate people from Arizona, and that we too pack every day our weapons. See, I, I pack every day myself. I carry my weapon around with me everywhere I go. There's nowhere where I am not within hand's reach of a 60 caliber weapon, 59 beads, <laughs> and one crucifix. <clears throat> Padre Pio called it the weapon of choice. He called it my weapon. And we also should take advantage of this weapon for many, many reasons. Our Lady of Fatima told Sister Lucy that there's no problem, no matter how difficult it is, that we cannot resolve by the prayer of the Holy Rosary. So that means whenever we are disturbed at any time during the day or at night, if we are mindful of this power that Our Lady promises to have through the rosary, we can resolve, according to her, any problem, no matter how difficult it would be. This promise alone should occur, encourage us to keep the rosary close at hand all the time. Blessed Pope Pius X said, give me an army saying the rosary and I will conquer the world. Hopefully uh, we will enlist ourselves spiritually at least in Our Lady's militia and Our Lady's army so that we can help fight the evil forces that are coming against the church, ourselves and our families. Maybe now we are in a better position to, if we are not already doing so, to commit ourselves to praying the rosary every day, just like Our Lady has asked us to do. Five decades, five decades of the rosary every day. The most often excuse that I hear from people is, I don't have time. And what I say to that is, you don't have, if you don't have enough time, you don't have enough time. <laughs> We need to prioritize, as we do, and we need to make sure that we fit in, what, 15, 20 minutes. 15 or 20, that's all it takes. And as St. Francis de Sales, doctor of the church, bishop, could finish his rosary on those days in which he was too busy to say it during the day, he would make sure he said it on his knees before he got into bed. And we all can do that, 15 20 minutes, that's all it takes. We need to make time for Our Lady. She promises us so much. And just to heat up the, the system a little more, let us be reminded what St. Louis de Montfort said, that devotion to Our Lady is necessary to obtain salvation. So this is really a matter of life and death. It's necessary for salvation. Praying the rosary is one of the sure ways of making sure that we are devoted to Our Lady. To kind of sum up this encouragement to pray the rosary every day, I'm going to just basically read through to remind us of the 15 promises that Our Lady makes for those who devoutly and perseveringly pray her rosary. The first promise is that they'll receive signal graces. And each one of these promises, of course, are worthy in itself of following her exhortation to pray the rosary every day. But here they are in 15 of them. 
And the second promise is that she'll provide special protection. The third, that it provides armor against hell, that it will destroy vice, defeat sin, and defeat heresies. Fourthly, it will cause virtue, withdraw hearts from the love of the world. The devout prayer of the rosary, fifthly, will not perish. Six, they'll never be conquered by misfortune. God will not chastise him in his justice. He shall not perish by an unprovided death. If he is just, he will remain in the grace of God and will become worthy of eternal life. Seventh, with true devotion to the rosary, he shall not die without the sacraments. He shall, eighth, he shall have the light of God and the plenitude of graces. Our Lady herself will deliver from purgatory those who had been faithful to the rosary, number nine. And ten, they will merit a high degree of glory in heaven. Eleven, you will obtain all you ask of me by the recitation of the rosary. These promises, of course, were given to Blessed Alan de la Roche, and he said that... Um, that he, in his vision of Our Lady, also received knowledge that Our Lady had communicated these to um, St. Dominic as well. So this one, you will obtain all that you ask of me by the recitation of the rosary. Remember Our Lady's words at Fatima, there is no problem, no matter how difficult it is, that we cannot resolve by the prayer of the Holy Rosary. I'm going to give two examples of resolving problems through the rosary. In 1955, Austria had a problem. It had the problem of Soviet occupation. And so what did they do? After 700,000 people agreed to pray the rosary in Austria. Guess what date the Soviets left the country? May 13th, 1955. That's solving the problem with the rosary. That's a huge problem, too. Second example of solving a problem with the rosary. Let's say you are rushing to get your kids to school on time and you don't have a second to spare, and someone is knocking at the door, and you open the door, and there are a couple of Jehovah Witnesses wanting to come in and talk to you about the watchtower. And you're not really sure what to say at this point, because you know if you get into conversation, it's going to get quite lengthy. But you don't want to just slam the door in their faces either. So what do you do? You invite them in to pray a decade of the rosary. And that will solve your problem. <laughs> we, we need to make sure that we're not afraid to introduce people to the rosary. I am, when I travel, I always carry extras with me in case I need to hand them out. Occasionally, may, I can remember one or two cases in which a person may have refused a miraculous medal or a rosary. But other than that, across the board, people are very happy to receive gifts. <laughs> Tell them about the rosary. Give them one. Give them a pamphlet. Don't be afraid to talk about the... We in this country, of course, are becoming more and more parochial, more and more ghettoized, but we can't talk about our religion. That's infringing on somebody's rights. It doesn't work that way in the Catholic Church with Our Lady. She wants us to spread the good news. And that just happens to tie into the 12th promise of Our Lady. The twelfth promise, to those who propagate the Holy Rosary will be aided by Our Lady in their necessities. So we're encouraged by Our Lady to propagate it. Give people rosaries. And more than likely, they're going to appreciate it. And it could be the difference between saving their soul and not. Thirteen, the entire heavenly court will be the intercessors of those who pray the rosary in life and in the hour of death. And 14, they will be sons and daughters of Our Lady and the brothers and sisters of our son, Jesus Christ. 
And number 15, praying the rosary is a great sign of predestination. For those people who are concerned about where they're going after this life, there's nothing like praying the rosary to help be assured and consoled that you're going to the right place. Our Lady says so. And that pretty much concludes as to the why to pray the rosary. And now I'm going to speak a little bit about how to pray the rosary. To introduce the, the how to pray the rosary, I'm going to kind of back up a little bit and talk about numbers. I'm going to talk about the number three. Our Lady herself knew how important the number three was. After all, she was Catholic. Our Lady knew how important three was when she gave the rosary to St. Dominic. Our Lady knew about the importance of three because she was a mother, because three is intimately connected with anything that's living, according to the pagan philosopher Aristotle, and also taught by St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, what I'm going to say is going to seem so obvious, but sometimes things that are profound are very obvious and common sense. Anything that's living goes through three stages of development a beginning, a middle, and an end. Obvious, yes, but just wait and see how this ties in. This is called the analogy of faith, by the way. And the analogy of the faith, that's a doctrine of the Catholic Church. In the faith, everything is tied together. And I'm going to tie a few things together just with the number three, just with anything living has a beginning, a middle, and an end. This tripart development is not only true for created life, but it's also true for the spiritual life. And so traditional teaching has it that there are three stages in the spiritual life as well, the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive. The purgatives, we clean house, get rid of sins. The illuminative, we walk in the way of virtue. We walk in the footsteps of Christ. That's the second stage, the middle stage. The final stage, the unitive way, is when we're united with Christ and we attain the perfection of our goal of being united with God. Three stages to the spiritual life, three stages to life itself. The number three. We also have three sets of mysteries to the Holy Rosary. We have the joyful mysteries, the sorrowful mysteries, and the glo glorious mysteries. The joyful mysteries, they correspond to the beginning of the spiritual life. Christ is first conceived. The beginning of sanctifying grace is, is at its very beginning. We see Christ develop as a, a human being. And we see him uh, begin to mature into later childhood. That's the joyful mysteries, which correspond to the first stage of the spiritual life. And then in the sorrowful mysteries, we struggle through the acquisition of virtue. Acquiring virtue is not easy. So we meditate on the sorrowful mysteries in that way to grow, especially in the virtue of patience, which suffering does also help us obtain. And then finally, in the glorious mysteries, we celebrate the goal of the spiritual life, he the heavenly life. That's really the goal of the spiritual life, to live life in heaven. And we can get some taste of that even now through our meditation on the glorious mysteries as we unite ourselves with Christ who ascended into heaven and who brought Our Lady to heaven as well. So we see we have threes all over the place. Three, of course, is so central to the Catholic faith that it just happens to be applied to the, the central dogma of the Catholic faith, namely the Holy Trinity. The Holy, three persons, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Three persons, one God, Trinity, and three is very important to the Catholic faith. Our Lady also referred to the rosary initially to St. Dominic as her Psalter, her Psalter. What is a Psalter? A Psalter is a book of Psalms. And how many Psalms are there? There are a hundred 
and 50, 150 psalms. So when she wanted us to pray the rosary, her psalter, she wanted us to pray 150 Hail Marys for those who couldn't read and pray the divine office. They would pray the Hail Marys instead. And how many Hail Marys would they pray if they're praying her rosary? They're praying 150. For Our Lady, the rosary is 150 Hail Marys. And when you divide 150 by 10, because each mystery gets 10 Hail Marys, you end up with 15, 15 total mysteries. For Our Lady, her rosary has 15 mysteries, 15 mysteries. <clears throat> now let's look at the number four. <clears throat> Just like three is Catholic, four is Gnostic. Gnosticism was an early Christian heresy that continues today within liberal Catholicism. Fourness is loved by astrologers and earth huggers and new agers. They love the number four. In fact, <clears throat> one of the greatest Gnostics of the 20th century, the psychiatrist Carl Jung, who was the number one disciple of Sigmund Freud, he considered fourness to be the most important spiritual symbol of all time. So for the Gnostics, four is what it's all about. He even, Carl Jung is on record of saying, he even considers four to be more important than three. <clears throat> For Carl Jung, Mary assumed into heaven resulted in the Trinity becoming a quaternity. <clears throat> Did you catch that? That's a heresy. But that wouldn't bother Carl Jung. He's already a Gnostic. He's already a heretic, okay? But anyway, so we have an example of how the Gnostics consider four to be more important than three. And so, should we think that Our Lady was having a bad day when she only gave St. Dominic 15 mysteries instead of 20? You see, because if you have three 15 mysteries, you have three sets, namely the joyful, the sorrowful, and the glorious. So either she was having a bad day and she kind of was holding the best for last, or four sets of mysteries is not really what it's all about. Maybe four is Gnostic, four sets of mysteries, like the luminous mysteries, for example, that would make four sets of mysteries. Now, I know some people say, well, you have a choice. Well, watch how much freedom you have in a place where they do the luminous mysteries, whether you have a choice or not in praying them. You'll soon find out that there's more of an obligation than actually a, a choice. Sometimes they feel that way. But anyway, traditionally speaking, we pray and we believe that Our Lady knew what she was doing when she gave her Psalter to St. Dominic. 150 Hail Marys divides very nicely up into 15 mysteries, which turns out to be three sets of mysteries as we pray traditionally the joyful, the sorrowful, and the glorious. Now, this threeness that is very Catholic just happens to also describe how many levels of prayer there are or how many types of prayer there are, all of which apply to the rosary. One of the things that we want to understand is that the rosary is not just a prayer for beginners. I've heard people say that. Oh, that's for children. No, it's not. And this is where some people could benefit from understanding the breadth of Depth, breath and depth of, of praying the rosary, that it's not just a vocal prayer, and it's not just a vehicle for mental prayer either, meditating on the mysteries. There's also an opportunity for contemplative prayer. So let's go over the three types of prayer, vocal, mental, and 
contemplative prayer. And each of those three types are available to us in the rosary. And we need to know that. We need to know about these three levels, if you will, of prayer to ensure that we avail ourselves of the opportunity of being raised up in contemplative prayer, if that's what God wants to do. The beginning, of course, the foundation of the rosary is vocal prayer, the Our Fathers, the Hail Marys. And, and, and if we're starting out and praying the rosary and that's all we do, we're fine. And if we're heavily distracted, I've heard some people say, well, I'm too distracted to pray the rosary. Better to do something in not such a good way than to not to do it at all. Even if you're distracted and you're just praying the prayers, you're praying vocal prayers, you're praying the rosary, you're fine. And it's sometimes very helpful just to do that, especially if you're in turmoil, you're distracted, or you can't meditate too well. So that's the first level, vocal prayer. The second level is mental prayer. We're, we're familiar with mental prayer in the rosary because we have 15 mysteries to meditate upon. You can easily, um, I don't know if there's one here, but you can get a, scriptural, a, a little book called The Scriptural Rosary, and it has a meditation for each of the Hail Marys. That will certainly tune you into the scripture and to the meditations that are available in each of the sets of mysteries. There are many, many books. There are web pages to help you pray through the mysteries. If you're unable to use your own imagination and think and consider what is actually occurring in each of the mysteries. Like, for example, our, our, our Lord is born in the nativity into a, a very cold manger, which is symbolic of the coldness of the world that he is being born into and so forth. Then we pray that our own hearts are not that way, but rather receptive and warm and preparing a beautiful, hospitable, loving dwelling place for him in our own souls and so forth and so on. When we pray the, for example, the scourging at the pillar, we're of course meditating on our Lord suffering for the sins against chastity. And we are praying to grow in that virtue as well as to do reparation for, for those sins as well. And then in the uh, glorious mysteries where we are considering Our Lady's assumption, we're, we're knowing that that same power that drew our Lord up to heaven is that same power by which Mary is being lifted up to heaven as well, which we also hope to share in that same power at the moment of our death as well. And so these are, th these are examples of mental prayer, cons using the reasoning mind to think through the different images and points of the rosary on each of the mysteries. And then finally, there's contemplative prayer. And that's a, just a little bit, little bit more difficult to describe. It's uh, more like watching a sunset. You don't need a script in order to watch a sunset. Sunset. It's beautiful. You're in awe of it. You, you are mesmerized by it. And the same thing can happen in prayer. We come across something beautiful in God or in Our Lady or in some truth or in some point of consideration that focuses us, that, that captures our attention, that that touches our hearts, and we want to stay there and be there with God and Our Lady and our Lord, and that's fine, and that's contemplative prayer. It's like biting on a tasty morsel and not wanting to rush through the next swallow, but wanting to savor and enjoy and delight in that particular portion of food. And the same thing can happen in prayer, and we want to know that that is available to us in the praying of the rosary. The rosary is for beginners, for people who are proficient, but also for the experts, for people in the unit of way. Imagine St. John of the Cross saying, oh, the rosary, I don't need to, I'm beyond that already. I don't need Our Lady's help anymore. I don't think he would say that. The rosary is for everyone and each of us. These uh, three levels of prayer, of course, correspond to the three levels in the spiritual life, as I've mentioned, the purgative, the, the illuminative, and the, the unitive way. And these three uh, levels of prayer, again, correspond to all of life and how it develops from beginning, middle, to end. And so we see that importance of the number of three of three, three sets of mysteries, the joyful, the sorrowful, and the glorious. 
In conclusion, again, why do we pray the rosary? Simply put, because our mother has asked us to do so. She knows what's best for us. We should, as she says, we should already begin to savor and to know the benefits from praying the rosary, and that should help us to continue to, to persevere, to say it daily, but also, not only for ourselves, but if we want peace in the world, Our Lady has given us the solution. We, see, we saw how it worked in Austria. It basically kicked out the Russians. If we want peace in the world, we'll pray the rosary. How do we pray the rosary? One simple way of learning how to pray. Pray. If you want to learn how to pray, pray. Our Lady will teach you. Our Lord will guide you in his Holy Spirit. No one can say, I, I don't know how to pray. Our Lord will help us, will give us that grace if we simply cooperate with what we can do and the best we can do it. We saw that with the three sets of mysteries, it corresponds with the three stages of the spiritual life, the three kinds of mysteries, and the three persons of the Holy Trinity. We saw with praying the rosary that would be um, an antidote to heresy, especially Gnosticism. We saw that with the rosary always at hand, that we have the greatest weapon against our spiritual enemies. We saw with praying the rosary that we've been promised that all of our problems can be resolved. And we saw in praying the rosary that we've been promised peace and peace in this world. And we saw also that the faithful and the daily recitation of the rosary, we are actually promised heaven. Now, all we have to do is to pray it, to pray it devoutly, lovingly, attentively, and to the best of our ability, and to pray it every day as she's asked us to do. Thank you. Thank you.